Thank you. It's so good to be here at Biola. I love Biola, and I'm a proud alum. Why do we have public education? Um, if you look back at Calvin or the Puritans when they started, they understood that the country need to have a learned citizenry. First, to read the Bible, uh, and then to read other documents, and to be learned enough to be able to participate as citizens in a democracy. I would say that public education is the backbone of democracy. Without public education, uh, I don't see how a democracy really continues to thrive. I agree with Diane Ravitch, who recently said that we're currently engaged in an epic battle for the future of public education. She went on to say, I do believe there is no successful society in the world that has not bolstered a strong public education system. And I totally agree with that. Now, before I go on with my comments, I want to just acknowledge Connie, who I met here at Biola, and 40 years, uh, 40 uh, some years ago, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and Proverbs 19.14 said, a virtuous wife is pr more precious than silver or gold, and that's why I'm wealthy in life, because of Connie. Thank you very much for being the love of my life, Connie. Biola is essential to our society. And why is that? Because you're sending out teachers and students and administrators, not just to the Norwalk, La Mirada area, but to the greater Southern California area, across the state, across the country, across the world. I note that here in the School of Ed, many of the teachers that you prepare, a uh, very diverse group, some of them, quite a few of them, go to LA Unified, and uh, just as one example. But to me, it's just as important that they know what to teach and how to teach, that they also understand their faith and how to integrate that faith. Because we're in a society right now that doesn't really value uh, uh, you know, the moral compass that we need to have. A democracy assumes that there's, there's some level of morality, that we know right from wrong, that we can watch out for each other, and that, um, that we have some sense of godliness and faith. And Biola continues to do that by teaching scripture, by teaching principles of faith, and integrating it into your education. And I have to say, I didn't fully appreciate, I loved my time here at Biola, but I didn't fully appreciate it until years later. So for you students that are here tonight, my advice to you, make every hour and day count. I know those deadlines are tough. You know, we have to stay up late. I had a roommate one time, and he would always not go out on Friday night. He'd stay up all night Friday if he had to, getting all his papers done, and I thought, that's nuts. I lived for Friday. <laughs> We're out of here on Friday night. Of course, then what happened? Saturday afternoon, you're in major panic mode, right? So and you're staying up late on Sunday night trying to get all those papers done. So I look back, I think, he was a little smarter probably, but that was, that was the way to do it. We have a society right now that doesn't hold as high as it should integrity. And at the core of being a Christian is to be a person of truth and of integrity. And Biola stands for that, and we need to take that to heart. Um, it is very easy to be around people who say one thing and do something else. In fact, we even have leaders in this country who are not people of integrity, who appear to be there only for their own self-interest. And that's a very sad thing. And for family, we need a renaissance in our society that what it means to be a parent and really take responsibility for your children and if possible, for both parents to be involved with their kids. And it, this is not words taken lightly. Uh, we've drifted quite away from that. We're in California. We're a very large state. We're a very diverse state. We're a high poverty state. But the one thing that should draw us together as a powerful state, besides education, is parents and parent involvement. And we can do a lot better on, on bringing parents, uh, I think, along as partners. Biola understands that it's wisdom that we need that we're looking to God to provide. 1 Corinthians 13 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God and he will give it to you. He will give it to you. Well, there's plenty of times when I felt like I did not have enough wisdom. And that's a lifelong habit, leaning on the Lord to give you wisdom. 
And the prophets of wisdom, as Proverbs 3.13, are, are, are great. I became a Christian in high school. It was my pastor that challenged me to come to Biola after I'd already been accepted to the University of Colorado. I believe the Lord led me there, led me here. And today, I'm sure the Lord led me here. So I'd just like to say publicly thank you to the Board of Trustees of Biola. I saw some of them earlier who have led this university for so many years. Just like in a school district, it's the board that really holds up a district and that should get credit for when a district is performing well and the leadership works together and teachers are being supported. Same here at Biola. The Board of Trustees has been remarkable over the years to hold to their core values. Uh, and to President Corey, um, a tremendous asset to Biola and a tremendous president. And now to new provost uh, David Nystrom, who came from the Sacramento area. Uh, and I would just like to publicly commend June Hetzel. Dr. Hetzel is the dean of the School of Education, and she is fabulous. A true state leader and represents Biola so well, as well as our Christian faith. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're going into homeschooling or private schooling or public schooling. I believe that parents are the students' first and foremost teachers, but we're, our job is to partner with uh, parents to finish that education wherever that should take place. I just want to go back to a point here now as I get in the remarks. California is a large state. We have 9.2 million students, zero to age 18. That's huge. 40% of the zero to 18 population are under age five. Now, many districts are seeing a decline in enrollment, partly because our birth rates are down, partly because immigration has slowed, but also because population is shifting, and that's typical for California. So if you're up in the valley or out in the high desert, you're seeing tremendous growth. If you're here, you might be in a district that's struggling with declining enrollment. That's just a shifting. There is a little baby boomlet on the way, and in some districts, they're already seeing kindergarten enrollments up. That, we have six point, approximately 6.4 million in K-12 public education. Now, did you know that in California, public schools, academic achievement is up? Many of you probably don't know that. Because right now, the press love to say that public school is failing, why teachers are not doing the job, why somehow administrators are making too much money, why somehow there's waste, and that is not accurate. Our graphs over the last 12 years have been consistently going up in mathematics and language arts. We have double the number of African American students in advanced placement classes in just the four, last four years. The Hispanic population continues to go up in achievement, particularly in elementary. Now, is that good enough? No. And have we lagged too far behind and now we're trying to play catch up? Yes. And we have a lot of heavy lifting to do and a lot more work. But it's not as if we're failing. We can call out those schools that are failing because we have an academic performance index. And you can't go by the state's list of 1,000 lowest performing schools because some of the schools on that list are at 900 API. Well, what? Because that list was done under a design through legislation that says you can only have so many schools that are low performing on that list in your district. And so you get them spread around all over the state, some of those schools are doing just fine. It is, it is a fact that we do need to focus more keenly on high schools and on some schools that are not doing well. But in general, we're doing pretty darn good and we can do a lot better. Parents are starting to get more involved. The next generation is gonna take this, I hope, it's what appears to be, a lot more seriously. And let me just remind you, parents really only wanna know three primary things. And I'm embarrassed to say this because when I was a teacher, I was not very clear on these three things. I would say, and we're having math today. Here's our math book when we have our parent back to school night. That really doesn't tell the parents much about what we're learning about math or anything else. But parents want to know, what is it my student is expected to learn? So they can be clear. If they don't understand that, then they can't really get on the same page as you. Secondly, how will I know how my student is doing? And third, what help is there for my student if they're really struggling? That's the three basic questions. And we can do a better job of working with parents and making them partners and answering those three questions. 
I enjoyed being Secretary of Education in a lot of ways. It was a job I didn't seek. I wasn't paying any attention to it. It came my way. I was glad to serve. I'm, uh, I'm a happy public servant. I'm um, proud to be a lifelong public educator. But I have to say, it was also the most frustrating job I ever had. Because at the time, we were starting to enter an economic recession. We had no idea how long and how deep it would be. But I'll tell you, on the joyful side, I got to visit a lot of schools, a lot of very poor schools. And the governor had not been out to some schools, so I had an opportunity to take the governor to a number of schools. And I remember when we pulled up at one of the schools uh, in downtown LA, there were a group of kids out there to greet us. And so I said, well, where are you going to take us? Um, uh, to the office. And I said, well, that'd be great. And I said, why are we going to the office? And one of the younger kids looked over and said, well, I, I'm not real sure what, what's going on. <laughs> Pretty cute. Maybe thought I did something bad. I had to go to the office. <clears throat> but having worked for both the state superintendent and the governor, I can tell you that the dysfunction of state governance and the structures there is pretty clear. And it's a sad thing. It's grown over the years. So I want to talk about some of the challenges and then some of the opportunities. And first of all, the first challenge is fiscal. We do have a fiscal crisis in the state. It's compounded by three different components. One component is cuts to education. Now, we've been seven years giving out pink slips to teachers. Seven years. I mean, most of you would not stay in a job where every spring you get a pink slip that says, we're not sure if we're going to be hiring you back next year. That's very unsettling for a young teacher, isn't it? And more likely than not, we hire most of them back. We manage to survive. I think it was Jim Brown that said, those smoke and mirror budgets look pretty good there for a while. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> we have to pay the piper now. The bill has come due. But what are the priorities for a state and nation? Two years ago, when the recession was really bad, all the countries around the world were having to make significant cuts. Singapore made significant cuts, but they increased their funding for education because their view was that we'll come through this recession, and when we do, we want to be the po poised to be the leaders in the world. That's pretty, that's pretty forward thinking. Can, can, can tuition continue to be raised in California and we still remain a worldwide leader? Our California budget is approximately $80 billion. We're $26 billion in debt. That's not just a 5% out of alignment. That is a big time out of alignment. If you look at K-12 education, years ago, Proposition um, 98 was passed to ensure a minimum level of funding for public education. Today, we're about $10 billion underneath that minimum level of funding. It's been an accumulating thing. It's money that the public system has not gotten. And at what point, the question that needs to be asked, at what point do we impact the capacity of the system? I'll just give you one little factoid. Our high schools have one half the number of adults on their campuses that the average high schools do in America, taking California out of the mix. Now that's rather stark. And you might say, well, I didn't really realize that. Let me just tell you that there's a big difference between the older people and the younger people and how they view education. Um, and I'll come back to that. When we're without counselors, our reading specialists, our librarians, our special, special education assistants, then are we beginning to undermine the very dream that we have for California and for our country that every student is entitled to an education and we'll give it to them because that's one of our priorities. It may be our top priority because they will solve the problems of the future if they're well-educated. It's like we're bleeding from little cuts. It's just little cuts. So you don't see wholesale layoffs. I don't know, you might this spring if the budget right now is looking pretty bad. But we're bleeding and the system is... Now, is money the answer? No. It's not the answer because we can be more efficient. And our California budget has been built on gimmicks too long, and now we're paying the price. But we do have 97 districts right now, K-12 school districts in California, that have qualified budgets. That means their county superintendent has certified them that they are not balanced either this year or next year. That's a pretty significant number. That's approximately 10% of all the school districts in the state. So the fiscal context cannot be taken too lightly. And I think it speaks to our priorities. 
Component number two is the initiative process. It has gotten a way out of whack in our state. Uh, people with money can put initiative on, on the ballot and get it passed. If you want to read a little bit, I'll suggest two books on this. One is Paradise Lost by Peter Schrag. That talks about what is it that's changing about California that some people think well, we lost our dream. I grew up here in California. I went to school here in the LA area. We had double sessions. I was the first in the wave of baby boomers. And we were in upstairs uh, uh, classes for most of the time that would never have passed. They weren't even that safe at the time. But we were, there wasn't space. And, and the classes were large. But we felt like we got a, a first class education. And if we have to do that, we'll do it again. We don't want to do that, but we'll do it again. But there's some structural things now that need to be changed. Another book to read is California Crack Up by Joe Matthews and Mark Paul. California Crack Up. They, um, they discuss the history of the initiative process and the budget process over the years. That brings us to the point we are now. We have a requirement in our state for a balanced budget. The governor proposes a balanced budget. The legislature works on the budget. By June 15th, the legislature gives back to the governor a balanced budget. The governor can either sign the budget, veto the budget, or blue pencil specific line items. We've had that in since the day of Reagan. Those are very powerful tools the governor has. But do we have a balanced budget? We haven't had a balanced budget for some years, let alone a budget that's on time. That really hurts us. The initiative process, I just want to give you two examples. Prop 49 seemed like a good idea at the time. I have an after-school program. Well, let me tell you what's happening. We're funding our after-school programs because it's in the Constitution. An initiative process puts it in the Constitution. So a constitutional um, initiative gets first cut at the money. They're getting their money while we're cutting K-12. Now, I don't want us to go like this, say, well, they have money and we don't. But if you think of the priorities over the big scale of things, I'm sorry, after-school would not be at the top of the priority to me it would be to make sure that we're funding our K-12 system before we get to after school. Another one would be Prop 10, the first five. I sit on the state first five commission for a while. Very well intentioned, and I'm a big fan of preschool. We have to do a lot more in early learning in our state, and we're on the right road to do it. But you've seen in the papers here how they say, well, that's my money. Even if they have a billion dollars in the aggregate surplus, they don't want the state to take it. And, and probably we can't take it, even though Schwarzenegger uh, try to take it, now Governor Brown's trying to take it. And why is that? Because it's in a lockbox through an initiative process. Now, I'm sorry, as much as I believe in preschool and high quality preschool, I don't think we should be cutting kindergarten and first grade and second grade and still funding preschool. So we can't fix those right away because those are initiative processes, those are initiatives, but that's a serious problem. Component number three is that the courts have had such a major role in dictating the care. Um, and level of service. And the biggest example of that is prisons that are right now under the district, uh, under a court uh, mandated magistrate. Our, our court system speaks from a philosophical point of view and a well meaning point of view. Why shouldn't prisoners get, have access to good health care? Well, in a pure world, that would be great, but we can't afford it anymore. We simply can't afford it. When prisoners are costing us four and five times what a public school student costs, there's something wrong with that picture. I'm sorry. Our, our, we've so uh, changed. So that's a couple of things just on the budget side. I alluded, and I want to speak to just a moment, about the young versus the older challenge. There's many my age and a lot more coming after me in the baby boom uh, generation, and we're mostly worried about pensions and, you know, and, and retirement, and, and that's understandable. So we may not be attuned as the young people are, as our daughters are, with their students, with their kids that they're going to be having, because their number one priority is going to be, where do I get them a good education? And can I get them a good education? Can I even afford a good education? What ha you know, if something's not going right in our community, why aren't we working for a better education? So if we're not careful, we'll have a divergency of values in our society. And unfortunately, at the moment, there's a lot more of us than there is of them. We got a lot of baby boomers in California. So that's, that's a component. Number three, we need politicians who will do their homework. Tell their constituencies the truth. Stand on their values. Be bold. And at the same time, compromise. 
In my view, a democracy only works when you send representatives to Sacramento or to Washington, D.C., and they use their best judgment on behalf of their constituents, but ultimately they use their best judgment on what's best. And that means compromise. I'm sorry, some people don't, they think compromise is a bad word. I tell you what's a bad word to me, no decision, yeah. not acting. That's the nature of it. We're in a society right now, we're so polarized that if you break, break ranks from one of the party you know, agendas, the party will turn on you. And we've seen that here in California numerous times. We can't have that. As Christians in particular, we should be standing up and supporting those that stand for the right values. We absolutely have to. Our voice needs to be heard more. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Democracy at its core um, is finding common ground. And common ground means compromising without giving up your core values. And I know that's a real challenge. But that's a challenge. And if we're not able to overcome that challenge, our democracy will be in big trouble. There are over, I said at lunch, there were 200 bills introduced in February. There were 2,000 bills introduced in February. So I'm not going to talk about legislation, as I said already in one of the classes, I think. But I'm really only interested in one bill right now, the budget bill. If we can't solve the bill, bill, budget, why would we be worrying about 2,000 other bills to tinker with this and that? We don't need any more right now. Right. We probably need less. Fourthly, we need citizens and institutions who hold to their values, who read and study. Um, there's, there's a theme in our society right now of anti-intellectualism. That's very unhealthy. That's why institutions like Biola and other public and private universities are very, very important. We need to instill that in our students. It's not just going to Wikipedia and learning something on a couple sentences. That's not studying. You have to learn to read complex texts, texts to discuss them, to argue about it, to analyze them. That's what a well-rounded education means. And by the way, California was the leader in espousing a comprehensive education, first through our standards and then through our curriculum frameworks. We always said that there will be the visual and performing arts, that there will be foreign languages, that there'll be health education, that there'll be physical education, as well as history, social science, and language arts, and mathematics, and science. It's that broad education that we espouse. And right now we're on a danger of squeezing it down, aren't we? It's a very dangerous path because we need, first of all, we need a broad education to engage kids. But more importantly, our society needs a broad education. I mean, I would have never predicted I'm doing what I'm doing in life. And, and many of you will have career changes as well in your lifetime. But back to, the, back to the citizenry, we need a citizenry that reads and that studies the issues and that gets involved. And most of you are Christians here tonight. And I would provoke you because you understand this, that, in, that you can't have a society without values. And you can't have a society that doesn't read and the study. We're in a soundbite society. I'm sorry, but some of the news shows are not news. They're not news. I can. So that's a challenge. That's a challenge for us as Christians. It's a challenge for us as a society. It's a challenge for Biola. And then the media. I started to allude to that earlier and how education is portrayed. It's astounding to me that the media loves to pick on education. Even we were flying down here this morning, Sacramento Bee, right on the front page. So-and-so was found guilty of something or other, and they just put that right up there on the front page. On the front page? Is that really newsworthy? It's like there's a culture of let's pick out what's not working. And I already talked about how California is doing well in student achievement, needs to be doing a lot better. LA Unified, for a number of years, was actually carrying the whole state in elementary reading because their reading scores were going up faster than the average. A lot of people didn't even know that. If you look at the, um, the program for international student assessment, the PISA scores, that we're often compared to, we say, well, Finland comes out on top, and China's coming up quick, and, you know, United States down over here. But let's think about what we've actually got here. Finland is a unified um, a national system who wrote their curriculum directly to the test. Well, smart on their part, I guess, if they thought the test was right. China really only measures Beijing. It's only Beijing. 
And that's true with the TIMS, the Trends in International Math and Science. So that's not a fair comparison. In our state in particular, we test, we have a very rich sample. We make sure it's representative of all of our schools, even NAEP. If we have a hard time comparing with other states, we've done the National Assessment of Education Progress, because even that comparison is a little bit in question. And our, none of our curricula are aligned to any of those. We come from the point of view, and I think it's right, although <laughs> I tell you we're in a tough way for it right now. But first you decide what kids need to know and learn. Those are our standards, our, our curriculum frameworks. And then you develop a test that measures that. But you don't institute that test until you've trained the teachers, and you have ongoing professional development, and you've provided curricula and other supports and resources to teachers in the classroom so they can teach that. And, and um, well-researched interventions for those students that are struggling, which means you have to have data back. Those are the components of... Uh, so if you go on to the next point, what is reform, which Diane Ravitch calls right now a national insanity over reform, a lot of it's driven by corporations and foundations. I mean, I did some work with Gates Foundation, but let's think of what other things the Gates Foundation has, has done. They funded small high schools. Well, that's a great thing to do. We're all for smaller high schools. But after a while, they decided, gee, that's not improving student achievement. So they pulled their money back. Most of the districts in Northern California had to give up those small high schools because they weren't sustainable financially. Well, how about if we use a well-researched and evidence-based approach before we institute any new reform? Right now, we've got the federal government advocating, let's really get hard on those lowest 10% of the teachers. Well, I can tell you, if, as a reform, you can eliminate the lowest 10% of the teachers. If nobody's doing anything different, your student achievement won't go up. What we should be doing is bring all the assistance we can to those weakest teachers, and then, if they don't improve, we'll have a serious conversation with them, and they can help them, we'll help them find a job in some other career. But it's not a punitive. And my wife was a teacher, and right now we have a culture where if you didn't know any better, and you're just reading the paper, you'd think, wow, I would never go into education. I wouldn't be a teacher. Look, those teachers must not be doing their job. No, the teachers are doing a very hard job. If you're a good teacher at all, you work very hard. And it's not on the backs of teachers. Some people say, well, it's a teacher's union that protects that. We're in a union state. I'm sorry, just the way it is. California's a union state. Most, uh, most uh, skilled laborers are unionized of one sort of another. The union is made up of the members, so the members can speak up and change the direction. But that should not be held against teachers. Teachers need to be honored. We're soon to have a teacher shortage in the state. You wouldn't know it right now because so many people are being laid off. Young people are saying, I don't, I don't think I'll go into teaching. There's not going to be a job for me. Yes, there will be a job for you because people my age, we are in fact at some point going to retire. And the, <laughs> and the, and the economy will turn around. In, 19, in 1890, the Committee of Ten declared U.S. education inadequate. And I just give that as an example. This is, you know, a cyclical thing. And it's, it's a healthy, and if you look at it from a sense that we know we need to do better, and we can do better in certain areas. It's not healthy if people for their political agendas or other interests start bashing public education, because you already know how I feel about it, that public education is the backbone of a democracy. I think a lot of the reforms we see now are structures. Charter schools, small schools, merit pay, those are the structures. Really, improving schools all has to do with that teaching and learning connection about how we help teachers be better and their effectiveness and how we measure that student achievement in order to keep uh, uh, teachers fully supported. I can tell you, a lot of teachers right now don't feel fully supported. And thank you for, the, for many of the principals that are here tonight because you, you hopefully know how to support your teachers. Uh, there's another school that we were on the same tour in downtown LA. We got there really early. We wanted to be there when the school opens. And as the buses started coming in, the students started coming on to campus, um, the principal said, well, I got to go now. You can follow me if you want. And off he went. He went to every classroom at that school, opening the door, asking the teacher, are you all set? Do you have everything you need for class today? And pretty soon he comes across a teacher, and she was, she was near tears. The projector wouldn't work, the computer wasn't working, the this and that. It's like everything stopped right there. He was totally focused on getting her back up to speed. And guess what? We all jumped in and pitched in to help too. Because that principal understood that the teacher is not well supported, prepared, and feels tremendous support from their principal, and it won't work. Mike.
Thank you. What does the research say? It's the most important reform is not testing, it's not data, it's not parent engagement even. It's clear curriculum and good teaching. That's the core of it. It's not complicated. Mike Schmoker has a new book out, Focus, Elevating the Essentials to Radically Improve Education. Many of us in public education have read him for years. That's a great book, by the way, a new book. In it, he says this, among other things, a coherent, content-rich, guaranteed curriculum, which ensures that the actual intellectual skills and subject matter of a course don't depend on which a teacher, on which teacher a student happens to get. Teachers that should make allowance for individual teacher preferences and individual skills. Students read, write, and discuss in the analytic and argumentative modes for hundreds of hours per school year across the curriculum. Read deeply, discussing, arguing, writing about what they read across multiple courses. He goes on to talk about the value of good lessons. So that's, that's the essence of it, is clear curriculum and strong teaching. Well, I was going to talk about the opportunities, but I'm going to use, save that, I guess, because I'm running out of time, and I'm going to talk about that as part of our panel. But I would just like to commend all of you uh, for being in education. You know, sometimes we have tools at our disposal that we don't realize. If you're a school administrator here today, do you have memorized education code 47612? <laughs> 47612 says that you can waive anything in the education code. Anything, well, except the civil rights uh, segments. You can waive anything. Sometimes we have tools at our disposal and we don't realize it. We do need to refocus our priorities in education. We need a laser-like focus on student achievement. And that's what, that's what we need to be about. And um, I'm glad to talk and answer questions as we go on to our panel. Thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.